Hey, everybody. Welcome to the most censored comedian in the country. Uh, I don't think that's far off from the reality. Thanks for joining me. Um, Going to also go live on Rockfin. So we're on Rockfin. We're on YouTube, which, you know, don't love considering they're the ones who've banned every Redacted Tonight episode around the globe. But uh, yeah, if you want to support this show, please check out patreon.com slash Lee Camp. I got a great episode for you today. And uh, let's dive right into it. I have another story, by the way, unrelated to Russia. Uh, well, mostly unrelated after uh, we talk with our guest. But let's uh, let's bring on the guest. This is uh, Brian Becker, incredibly accomplished human being. Um, but his his project right now is called The Socialist Program, a great podcast that everyone should check out among the many things he's done over his career. But hey, Brian. Hey, Lee. Thanks for joining me. Um, so, yeah, the, the whole Russia, the Ukraine thing, pretty cut and dry. I think uh, just a couple of minutes will clear it all up and uh, should, no, no problem. should have it figured out. Um, no, there's there's certain aspects of it I specifically wanted to talk to you about, um, because obviously it's it's been covered to death in one regard or another. But, you know, fighting fighting the the massive propaganda is is no easy uh easy feat. And I feel like we have to begin this because it's by saying, uh, and and the reason I feel we have to say this is because it's amazing how people just assume if you give any context to this, it means you're supporting the invasion or you support war. So I just wanted to start out by loudly saying, and I, I think I can speak for both of us. We're opposed to war. We're opposed to all war. Russia should not be invading Ukraine. The U.S. also shouldn't be shipping missiles, expanding NATO, et cetera. And I feel like you have to say that up top or people will just go, oh, you you just like Russian bombing, apparently. Yeah. 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 And also, you, you know, perhaps the most urgent question, the most important question is how does the war end? I mean, that, yeah, that was going to be one of my questions to you. Is, yeah. Is, I mean, because how, how do you see this ending? <laughs> because how how it began offers the biggest clue as to how it can end. How it began is really the part where if you explain to people how it began and who caused it, then you get labeled as an apologist for Russia. Because the reality is, if you're being objective, the United States did cause the situation. Putin in December 2021, end of the year press conference, he said right out in front of the whole world, we have red lines. And we really are serious. We're not going to allow Ukraine or the other former Russian allies or Soviet allies or republics of the Soviet Union to be a staging ground for advanced missiles that will be placed in their country, but on our border. And those missiles will target us and they'll, they have a flight time of five or six minutes. We're not going to let that happen. And so we urge serious negotiations. We, we mean it. And and he had this plan B, which he was also obviously advertising to the world by amassing 150,000 Russian troops in Russia, but near the border with Ukraine and in Belarus, which is to the north of Ukraine and, a, and an ally of Russia. So here you have Putin saying, we really mean it. We're not going to let Ukraine become like sort of the tip of the spear against us and let's negotiate. And I don't know if he expected the U.S. might negotiate, but the U.S. clearly took the position Russia's demands, which are national security demands, are non-starters. And they said, you can't tell us who we can include in NATO, and you can't violate Ukrainian self-determination by dictating to Ukraine what alliance they will be in or won't be in. So you, Russia, you just have to swallow it. Now, at a certain point, there was a shift inside the Russian government thinking because for 20 years, the Russians who didn't like all of this eastward expansion of NATO swallowed it. They took it. They, they basically appeased the West. They basically said, this is a threat, but they didn't really do much about it. And this time, to the shock of all of us, they did do something about it. So what was the U.S. thinking? Were they hoping that, that, that Putin would blink? that he wouldn't do the thing that would you know, cause Russia to be evicted from the world economy and allow the United States to you know, unite all of the European powers against Russia? Did they think 
that he would blink, in which case he would look like a weakling and the America, the, the, the neocons would look strong and it would show that a hard line works? Or did they think he wouldn't blink and that he would invade, in which case uh, they actually have the same outcome, which is Russia invades, the U.S. evicts Russia from the world economy, Russia is completely demonized, Russia looks like the bad guy because they're the ones who pulled the trigger first, and the U.S. reorganizes all of the NATO countries in Europe, which have been sort of moving away from the U.S., they were moving towards the Belt and Road Initiative. They were moving yeah. towards better relations with with uh, between Germany and Russia, for instance. So we don't know. You know, we don't. We weren't fly. We weren't a fly on that wall. But we know very clearly how this happened and how it could have been prevented. And my position is: if you care about Ukrainians, if you want to stop the bombing, begin to negotiate. Sending more javelin missiles, upping the ante, talking about a no-fly zone. None of that's going to stop the war. The only thing that will stop the war is to sit down, negotiate, and we know what the issues are, and they're back to where we were in December. And I, and I want to get into that, you know, negotiations and, and the idea of it in a second. Uh, but you you said something on uh, one of the episodes of Socialist Program that I hadn't heard from others, which was you thought maybe the U.S. Th theorized or figured that Russia would be pushed to basically take or declare independent the Donbass region. And then the U.S. could say Russia's invaded that part of Ukraine. So we have to make the rest of Ukraine part of NATO. And it would kind of unite again, the, the NATO countries and everything. Um, but they didn't seem ready for Putin to g fully invade all of Ukraine. That's that's my theory. Of course, it's a theory. I can't yeah. I can't prove it. But when you when you think about the fact that Putin was being so serious and amassed all those troops. And also he has a domestic problem at home because the Russians know about what's happening to the their Russian speaking brethren in the Donbass and Donetsk and Luhansk. I mean, 14,000 or certainly somewhere between 10 and 14,000 people in that area have died. Those people can consider themselves historically Russian. I mean, they were, you know, made as a part of Ukraine, as Putin points out, when the when when the Soviet Union created this thing called the the Socialist Republic of Ukraine, so part of the Russian the Western Russian population, uh, which is the eastern part of Ukraine, was put into Ukraine, but it didn't seem to matter that much at that time because they were all one country. You could have a Ukraine Republic, a Russian Republic, an Azerbaijan Republic. They were all part of the Soviet Union. They were one country. Right. So they still, many of them still considered themselves Russian. To but they day. considered themselves to Russian. So, yeah, yeah, and I got, I digress. But Putin, Putin had a problem because if, if the, if the Russians are being shelled by this Russophobe government that took power in the 2014 coup against Russia and against Ukrainian neutrality, and there are a lot of Nazis who have been incorporated, especially in Maripol, which is where the intense fighting is, the Azov Brigade, the Nazi-loving sectors of Ukraine society, which are decidedly a minority, but they've been incorporated into the National Guard and they are shelling Russians over there. So Putin solves a domestic problem. He says, OK, we're going to put our foot down. We're going to come to the aid and rescue of the people in the Donbass. And then I think the Americans thought that that's what he's going to do. And then they can say, see, Putin is the aggressor. They accomplish the same thing. They immediately incorporate Western and Central Ukraine, which is the biggest part of the country, into NATO. And they accomplish the same thing, but it makes Putin look like the bad guy. So I think, you know, when I, you know, for all of us who have been doing this anti war organizing for a long time, there are moments when we can think back to events like the Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in August 1990. I mean, Saddam Hussein called in the U.S. ambassador, April Gillespie, a week before the, the Iraqis moved in. They were having a big fight between the royal family in Kuwait and the Iraqis. And, and the Iraqis view Kuwait the way the Chinese view Hong Kong, like the British came and stole it. And, right. um, and so there's a lot of nationalism around Kuwait. So, so Saddam meets with the U.S. ambassador and says, look, uh, this is getting out of control. We might have to take action against Kuwait. And the, the American ambassador says, April Gillespie says, we don't have any position on inter-Arab disputes. We're neutral. So <laughs> Saddam says, 
oh, the Americans are giving me the green light. So he swoops in. He, fig- he takes over Kuwait in like eight hours because it's such a tiny little, you know, it's an oil company with a flag. Right. And so he sweeps in, captures Kuwait City, expecting that there will now be like a, a pro-Iraqi government that will be set up. But the Americans send a half a million troops to Saudi Arabia and prepare for war. And he, and like, I think the Iraqis were completely shocked that the Americans actually wanted a war. I was in Iraq, by the way, right. uh, shortly thereafter, and I was meeting with the hostages and um, the American hostages and European hostages. And as, as a matter of fact, the State Department released, I mean, Saddam released 16 hostages to the delegation I organized with Muhammad Ali to take back as a peacekeeping good faith effort. And and when I got there and we met with the hostages, we said, we said if you, there's any way for any of you to get out, you need to get out because there's going to be a war. And they were like, no, there's, there's not going to be a war between the U.S. and Iraq. This is just a dance. And we're like, no, the U.S. didn't send a half a million troops to Saudi Arabia to negotiate. That's for a war because the U.S. wanted the war. And I think the U.S. And also before that time, before that time, the U.S. had cooperation with Iraq and oil deals with Iraq. And, you know, there's the famous and chemical video. weapons with Iraq, because <laughs> right. the, the day the day after this is people can look this up. The day after Saddam Hussein, it was confirmed, had used chemical weapons against uh, Iranian troops who were outnumbering Iraqi troops. So chemical weapons are like that scary weapon that devastates or terrorizes a, an entire battlefield. Saddam used those chemical weapons that had been purchased from Western countries. And the day after it was confirmed, Donald Rumsfeld, yes, Donald Rumsfeld, who you know was leading the charge in the Iraq invasion in March 19, 2003, he shows up in Baghdad and he's Ronald Reagan's envoy to Saddam Hussein. And they take pictures hugging each other, hugging and yeah. kissing each other the day after it was confirmed that Iraq used chemical weapons against Iran, because those were good chemical weapons, not the bad ones that <laughs> were later used. So, right. so I kind of feel like the U.S. I don't, I'm not saying they absolutely set a trap for the Russians, but they created a set of circumstances where if Russia blinks and backs down, Putin looks weak. If they invade and take part of Donbass, he's still the aggressor, and Ukraine gets moved into NATO. And I think that Putin kind of understood the whole deal. I don't think he's naive. And they decided, look, we're going to take all of Ukraine. So none of Ukraine can be brought into NATO. But what I think Russia's miscalculation was, had to do with the the tenacity of resistance. And I think they thought Zelensky would run away. I think they thought the Ukrainian military would flee, that this show of force by mighty Russia would, you know, get it all done. And so it wouldn't look the way it looks now, like week after week after week of you know, human beings, civilians dying as yeah. a consequence of Russia's invasion. Yeah, which is uh, horrific on on all sides. Yeah. Um, so I want to you you mentioned the 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 Nazis and the Azov Battalion, and uh, you know, there's debate about how much influence they really have in Ukraine. But I wanted to talk about that for for a moment. I wanted to show this uh, article. Um, think it just came out recently. Um, but it, uh, it, it is NBC News, which is why I think it's important. So this is mainstream media. And it is uh, confirming. The title is Ukraine's Nazi problem is real, even if Putin, Putin's de- denazification claim isn't. So, you know, they're admitting there is a Nazi problem. They go on in the article to say how, you know, unhinged uh, Putin's denazification claim is. Uh, is it is it unhinged? Is it just a, a, a form of propaganda to to just you know? There's many justifications for the war, but part of the justification, or is it you know? I, I interviewed uh, Scott Ritter, former UN weapons inspector. He said, you know, the Nazi influence in Ukraine is it's not a huge number, but they are the most violent and the most strong, and so the politicians largely cower to them, so they have huge pull. Um, so how do you view it and how do you view this idea of denazification? Um, I think it's a, I think the Nazi force is legitimized inside of Ukraine following the coup. I mean, without the Nazi, when I'm saying Nazi, I'm talking about right sector and Azov brigade and and a few others. They, they were the muscle that staged the coup in February 22nd, 2014. So 
the, the agreement that was signed between Yanukovych, who was a, trying to keep Ukraine neutral, and the Maidan protesters who wanted Ukraine to come into NATO, uh, he agreed he'll pull the police out of Maidan, out of the center of Kyiv. And, and they, he did that. And the next day, these fascist militias carried out this armed struggle and dispersed the Congress. So it was like January 6th, except actually succeeded. You know, it was like taking over and dispersing Congress, um, the, their parliament, and the president fled for his life. Now, then the, the U.S. didn't want to have a Nazi-led government because that's pretty embarrassing. So what they did is they brought in non-Nazis like Yatsenyuk uh, and then later Zelensky. And they said, no, see, they're not Nazis. But the Azov Brigade, who are Nazis and love and, you know, use fascist insignia and loved the fascist heroes built who killed. I mean, the greatest pogrom, by the way, the greatest genocide against Jews was there, right there, there and in Poland. And the Nazis did it. And the, the fascist loving forces like the Azov Brigade in the right sector, they're, the people they admire are the people who committed with Germany the genocide against Jews and non-Jewish Ukrainians at that time. So they were incorporated in Maripol in the southeast, where all the shelling is going on, into the National Guard. So they're legitimized in the National Guard. So they're not any longer an extra legal force. They've actually been brought into one of the arms of the state. And they have been the tip of the spear against Russians. When Putin said on his February 21st speech, we're going to we're going to get you know, we're going to get even with the Nazis. We're going to denazify the country and we're going to hold those who committed these crimes to, to uh, for their own justice. He was talking about the, the burning alive of pro-Russian or Russian speaking progressive trade unionists in the trade union building in Odessa. And that happened right after the coup. And then uh, the fascist forces in that part of the country are very they're very formidable. They're very violent. And we know from the Nazis, you know, the Nazis, Hitler, people really don't understand Hitlerism very well because we just talk about it in broad historical ways. The Nazis were a tiny minority. They were like one or two percent in, in Germany in 1928. But they grew strong because they used what what Hitler himself called the cult of violence to intimidate and scare and terrorize their opponents. And terror works. I mean, bullying with guns and 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 knives at, at peaceful rallies, that works. We know that from the Proud Boys. We could hardly demonstrate before January 6th here in Washington because the Proud Boys were out. The police were giving them the green light and they were truly terrorizing the hell out of people and demonstrations stopped getting canceled. Now, you could say I, I, I was I was nearly killed in uh, Charlottesville. Yeah, yeah, or in Charlottesville. And in Washington, D.C., you could say, well, what's the Nazi influence in Washington, D.C.? Well, it's quite small, actually. But for a certain period of time, when the Proud Boys were running the streets after the November 2020 election in Washington, they were pretty formidable. You don't need that many. And that's the situation in Ukraine. And I was at protest, by the way, here in Washington, D.C., uh, mainly Ukrainian-Americans protesting you see Azov Brigade and right sector flags and insignia all over the place. They're not considered to be like too much or too far out in the fringe. They're accepted. They're there. That doesn't mean most Ukrainians are believe in what they believe in, but the fact that they're tolerated. It's like if I went to a demonstration, an anti-war protest, and people came with swastikas and Confederate flags, I'm quite sure we'd evict them. You know, we would say, well, whatever your opposition is to a U.S. foreign policy, we're not marching with Nazis. Right. Well, these people are actually marching with them. Yeah, uh, pretty incredible. And I think confusing to your your average American. And of course, America forgets that Russia lost, you know, 25, 27 million people to Nazis. So they have a bit of a, a bit, bit of their panties in a twist over over Nazis. Um, but I also wanted to ask about. The the a bit of the, a bit of the history of NATO. Um, we you know I've mentioned several times on this show that that it's expanded a lot, uh, and I was kind of surprised that you know I was talking to someone who's rather smart and and uh, you know claimed to be opposed to war and everything and want this to end, but they still referred to NATO as a defensive military alliance, 
which of course makes me laugh, but I'm kind of surprised how many people believe that. Yeah. So NATO was formed in 1949 and the Warsaw Pact, the socialist equivalent of NATO, like the Soviet Union side, they have sort of a symmetry. So NATO was formed by the U.S., all the American allies in Europe, except Germany in 1949, West Germany, were brought into NATO. First, it was a small number, and then it kept growing and growing. It was it started in a in a ceremony at the Pentagon in 1949. And um, the U.S. was very worried about the spread of socialism in Europe because all of the old capitalist governments had been fascist. It wasn't just Italy and Spain and Portugal and Germany. All of continental Europe was under the domination of fascists by 1941. And, and so the left was the resistance in Europe. So after World War II, Europe is devastated. The cities are smoldering in ruins from the magnitude of the violence. And the left is very strong. So the US was super worried about the left in Europe. And they were worried that it would affiliate with the Soviet Union. So the US pumped billions of dollars in the Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe, including its defeated enemies like Germany. And, and Italy, and brought those economies back into formation. And then they also created NATO so that all of the European countries were now literally under the U a U.S. chain of command because they would, only America was still really intact militarily. So the U.S. kind of rebuilt Europe economically and militarily, and NATO was an expression of that. It still is. The NATO budget right now, the if you look at all the NATO countries combined, all 30 of them, their military budget is about 1.25 trillion, 1.25 trillion. The US military budget is officially like 780 billion. So this one country, the United States, has more military spending each year than all of the other 29 countries combined by a hunt by by double. So right. it's always been a US-led military alliance. Then in 1954, the Soviet Union, Stalin has just died in 1953. There's a transition going on. The Soviets want to end the Cold War because after losing 27 million people and having your country devastated, you mainly want peace. You mainly want to you, you want a period of, 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 of peace so you can rebuild and recover. I mean, most of the young Russian and Soviet men between the age of 17 and 21 were liquidated in that war. I mean, it was a terrible moment for the Soviet Union. So they proposed in 1954, after Stalin dies, to the Americans, look, why don't we do this? Why don't we, the Soviet Union, join NATO? You know, meaning we'd be like basically in a chain of command that you're leading. And the only, our only de other demand would be that West Germany not be remilitarized. And of course, Germany was the invading country in the Soviet Union 10 years earlier. So the U.S. says, F you, no way, and immediately brings West Germany into NATO the re and remilitarizes Germany. So then, and only then in 1955, does the Soviet Union create what are called the Warsaw Pact countries, meaning the mirror image of NATO on the socialist camp side. And it's so weird because I read the New York Times, I read the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, I read all of the mainstream media from which we learn so little, but I read it every day just to stay up with it. And I can't tell you how many times I see the formulation that NATO, which was formed in response to the Warsaw Pact, you know, military alliance led by the Soviet Union. It was formed six years later with the Warsaw Pact and after the Soviets were rejected to be a NATO member. And now Putin, by the way, Putin said, we asked, I asked Bill Clinton whether we could join NATO after communism was overthrown in the Soviet Union. And we said, we'd be part of NATO. And, the, and, and Clinton said, no, no. Why, if you want a, a security architecture in Europe, why not include Russia? Why not yeah. bring them in? They're not communists, so they're not trying to spread world revolution. Not that they really were before either, but I mean, why not? And the real reason I believe is if you bring a country as big as Russia into NATO, then you kind of treat Russia as an equal. And if you, there's not a confrontation with Russia and they're treated as an equal, the natural trajectory of European countries in Eurasia will be to gravitate towards Russia as a trade partner, to have economic uh, and political interaction, even diplomatic and possible military interaction. So for America, NATO was always about how to control Europe. 
It was never about defense. And the only wars that NATO has waged were in Yugoslavia when it bombed the hell out of Yugoslavia in 1999, in Afghanistan. That's not part of the North Atlantic. And 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 Libya, where the right. U.S. and NATO par- partners destroyed the Libyan government. None of them defensive. None of them no. <laughs> were being were a response to being attacked. It was in 1999. The U.S. dropped 28,000 bombs and missiles on Serbia and Yugoslavia, a real a small country. And then they said we're going to have a ground war, just like Russia's doing now. By the way, they always say this was the biggest thing since World War II. The U.S. said to Milosevic in on June 3rd, uh, 1999, look, you either capitulate and surrender and leave Kosovo, which has been a province of Serbia like for 400 years. You either leave it right now and give it to NATO, which is what happened, or we're going to launch a ground invasion against you and all of the you, all the NATO countries are going to invade. So under that pressure, Milosevic, who had resisted under the bombing, said, okay, we give up, uncle, you get Kosovo. And then, of course, you know, three years later, Milosevic was in the dock at The Hague for being a war criminal. Uh, And if that had been an American in that dock, then uh, America would have invaded because we have the Hague Invasion Act. (laughs) That's right. That's right. The Um, Hague would have been bombed. I mean, actually, countries that supported uh, bringing the U.S. to the International Criminal Court are being sanctioned or threatened with sanctions if they vote at the U.N. for bringing American military personnel to the International Criminal Court for war crimes and crimes against humanity. That's the U.S. official position. If you vote yes to, to say we have committed or potentially committed war crimes, we will sanction you. And yeah, that's one of the one of the bigger uh, things we see in the State Department cables in uh, the WikiLeaks files. The book is how much pressure the U.S. has put on a bunch of countries to not support the ICC, uh, to to not vote for it, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, you know, we, we, we're not going to get into all of it, but then NATO expands many times over the years. It's now, what, 30 countries and uh, 30 and many of them surrounding Russia, which, you know, it keeps saying are red lines, but the U.S. doesn't seem to care uh, and keeps adding countries. The Ukraine was uh, in talks that were connected to NATO. Um, I wanted to uh, to ask another thing I see a lot from from people is so it seems like it seems to me as someone who's anti-war that the only way this ends is with sitting down at a table, Ukraine, Russia, and hashing out an agreement, some sort of peace talks. It seems to me that's the only way it ends without just endless killing. And it seems to me that the U.S. kind of wants this to continue for the foreseeable future, you know, sending missiles and guns and and not really wanting Ukraine to sit down and be serious uh, about talks. But, uh, you know, uh, someone I was talking with said, well, there's no there's no way Ukraine should sit down at a negotiating table considering they're being invaded. You don't sit down and talk when you're being attacked. And I want to hear your response to that. Well, you know, the the Vietnamese could have had the same position, couldn't they? I mean, the United States dropped more bombs on Vietnam, a country the physical size of the state of Minnesota, than were dropped by all combatants combined in World War II. And the Vietnamese were determined to fight and fight and fight. And at the same time, they negotiated. And uh, they could have done a lot of very provocative things. They could have taken John McCain and the American pilots who were dropping bombs on their villages from 30,000 feet and put them in the center of Hanoi and said, you want to bomb our cities? Go ahead. They didn't do things like that. They sat and they negotiated because they were interested in in showing that the justice of their cause and they were appealing to world public opinion. And that had a very, very big impact. Countries always negotiate while they're fighting. There's nothing new about that. The thing is, Ukraine and Russia are negotiating, but the U.S. doesn't, as you uh, sort of hinted at, the U.S. I actually think does not want this war to end. The U.S. is very, very happy about the war because right now Russia's bogged down apparently in Ukraine. So the fighting's going to go on and on and on. That means all of the European countries are wedded more and more to the United States. Anti-NATO sentiment can't really express itself under these circumstances in Europe. Uh, Russia is being evicted from the world economy. That puts a lot of pressure on its principal ally, which is China. So you see the United States is trying to see if there's 
if there's a way to separate Russia and China, just the way they separated the Soviet Union and China as a, as a divide and conquer tactic in the, in the 1970s when Nixon went to, to Beijing. And the U.S. has a pretext for you know, like really ramping up military spending. This is great for America. I mean, when you look at the news coverage, yeah. none of there's not this kind of yearning for like negotiations. It's like we must do more. We must send more weapons that you read the Washington Post. There's no like, how do we get to peace? It's like, how do we do more to accelerate the war? And what's the how do we get closer to nu nuclear war too? a no fly zone will mean a nuclear war. And 70 percent of the American people uh, now supported. Apparently we're I, our group, the PSL, we're going around to. We just printed 50,000 brochures that said basically oppose a no-fly zone. It's a terrible idea. You think you're, you people think, oh, this is a way to have Russia's planes not drop bombs on Ukrainians. But what it means is that American aircraft and NATO aircraft will shoot down Russian aircraft and then they will retaliate and both are nuclear power. So the idea that the American people have been hoodwinked momentarily into supporting something that will inevitably lead to nuclear war is really something. But I think there's another goal the U.S. has now. Putin, if the war drags out and, it, and Russia does not succeed right away, the U.S. hopes that there will be like an overthrow of the government in Russia. Maybe Putin will be assassinated. Maybe he'll be executed. Maybe there will be a coup d'etat. Uh, Russia will be in a much, much weaker position as a geostrategic force. It's a big country. It's got a lot of natural resources. And it was emerging as a, you know, a major power again after having been basically devastated by the, the decade of the 1990s following the overthrow of the Soviet Union. So Russia would come back, but on a much weaker uh, position. China would be deprived of its main major power ally. The U.S. The big goal for the U.S., of course, is to is to basically dismember or weaken or overthrow the government in China. So I think the U.S. is quite happy with the outcome. Uh, I, you know, that's why that's why I've, I've thought from the beginning this was. I didn't think Russia would invade because I thought it would be so beneficial to the U.S. or right. likely to be beneficial, and and not really provide real security for Russia. But you know. They're making their own calculations. I think that something happened inside the Russian government that caused this, this shift, this dramatic shift where they thought, Putin said it basically on February 24th. He said, he criticized Stalin. It was a really interesting speech. He criticized Stalin for signing a non-aggression pact with Germany and then being surprised by German the German invasion in 1941, where millions of Ukrainians and Russians died with this sort of surprise attack. And so he said, like, if war is coming, we've learned from history that appeasing the enemy is not a recipe for success. It just makes us weaker and more will die. So it's kind of like Putin came to the idea. I, this is the only thing that makes sense to me, that war is coming uh, and that we should we should take we should strike first so that the enemy is not right up on the Russian border that will the, the border will be pushed to the Polish border with Ukraine. That's a dramatic shift in Russian thinking, but I actually believe that that's what it's at least what they convince themselves of. Yeah. Uh, last question, because I don't want, I don't want to use up all your time, but uh, I did want you to go into a little bit like in the U.S. We're we're basically told by our media and everything to view, you know, basically the last six months is all you're allowed to think about. You can't think before that. There's really is a goldfish memory. Uh, but I, I was hoping you could just uh, real quick um, go through kind of where Putin came from, how he ended up at the top of the Russian government and the U.S. connection to that. Right. So um, so Boris Yeltsin, um, who was the anti-communist president of Russia in 1991, he, along with two other leaders of the of former Soviet republics, there were 15, but three of them got together, the Ukraine, Belarus and Russia under these very right wing governments that were very pro-American and America loved Boris Yeltsin. They right. said, Soviet Union is gone. We dissolve it. We're anti-communist now. And basically all the public property in those areas started being looted by the people who we now call the oligarchs. So the people with influence either in the black market or within the former Soviet apparatus basically took control over what had been public property and privatized it and became very rich. And America loved them. But Boris Yeltsin 
uh, was so unpopular. By the way, in 1996, he was going to lose in the election to the Communist Party. So the U.S. sent mil uh, election advisors to, to Moscow, and they uh, Yeltsin's approval rating was 6% by 1996 because the economy had been so devastated. So the American political machine went into high gear, sent operatives into Moscow, and they basically saved Yeltsin's ass. And if you look at Time magazine, it says Yanks to the rescue. Right. It's a big right. picture of a drunken Boris Yeltsin. It's his but, famous, famous cover of Time magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Famous cover. So then by 1999, Yeltsin can't even function. He's drunk. He's weak. He's like, he's, he's washed up. He picks Vladimir Putin to be basically his successor. And at first the United States is quite happy with Putin. I don't know if you remember, but Russia cooperated with the U.S. around September 11th. That was the funny thing about Zelensky's speech. He said, remember September 11th? Well, Putin and Russia was all about helping America on September 11th. And they, and, and, and they, and he, and Putin's a capitalist and it was capitalist societies aligning to some degree. Yeah. The oligarchs. I mean, the thing was he, Russia was so devastated and it's too big of a country to remain like a devastated neo colony of the West. So America became disillusioned with Putin when he sort of disciplined the oligarchs and helped Russia get back on its feet. But he would never he never nationalized the property of the oligarchs. Right. He condemned Lenin and the Bolsheviks. He condemned the communists. He said it was a terrible nightmare. You know, he and George W. Bush looked into his eyes. He said, I looked into the man's eyes and I could see his soul. And he was a good man. Right. I mean, that's how George W. Bush felt about Putin. And then uh, in, in, at the Bucharest summit in NATO, NATO's Bucharest summit in 2008, April, the U.S. says to the shock of the Germans and the French, well, we're going to include Ukraine and, and Georgia, the two westernmost republics of the Soviet Union and Russia's closest allies. We're going to incorporate them into Ukraine. And Russia said no, and then immediately moved its troops into Georgia. And that's when the Georgian conflict happened. Right. And, and then... Everything started to go south with Putin. But remember, Hillary Clinton came in as Secretary of State under Obama, met with Lavrov, who was the Russian foreign minister, presented him with this great big red reset button and said, let's press the reset button. Let's get back on track. Let's have good relations. And that was America. Obama was bringing Putin back in. But then what really shifted the thinking was what happened in Syria, because the, the Russia abstained at the UN and allowed the authorization of military force against Libya in 2011. The US destroyed Libya and then said, and as you will remember, Assad must go, Assad must go. So Hillary Clinton, the Washington Post, then Obama started echoing it. He was a little bit reluctant at first. Assad must go. So the Russians under Putin thought like, oh, they're going to destroy Syria now, they're like destroying all of the countries that are historic allies of Russia in the resource rich Middle East. Right. And Putin moved Russian military forces in and said, no, we're not going to let this happen. And that's when he starts to get really demonized. And then later that year, in 2013, the Maidan protests start and the U.S. supports a coup d'etat led by fascists in, in February 2014 to make Ukraine really a non-neutral country. Before then, Putin was fine. They invited him to the G7. The G7 became the G8. Right. He was a pro-capitalist guy. He was fine until he reasserted Russia's national security interests, which were detrimental or perceived to be detrimental by U.S. policymakers to the main overarching goal of American policy, which is to have unilateral domination over everybody. And so that's why they started to go after Putin. Well, Brian, I can't thank you enough and uh, highly recommend everybody check out the Socialist Program. Um, anything else I should tell them to, to look at? Well, I just want to, if, if people do uh, go to our, the Socialist Program, we had our great interview with you last week, Lee, because... I am, I am excellent. <laughs> you are excellent. And, and the reason the excellent, important context was that you are being, as you said, perhaps the most censored uh, media figure right now in the United States. I don't know how, I mean, you couldn't have seen that coming like a year ago that you'd be at number one censored <laughs> media personality, but it's such a disgrace that a country that says democracy really above all else means the first amendment, the right to speak, 
the right to, to redress grievances, and the right to have your media, the media you want to hear, take this away uh, and have this kind of censorship against you and others. It's really a disgrace. And, it, and it's amazing how often when you when you bring that up, people want to go, well, yeah, but, uh, but they're shutting down media outlets in Russia. And I go, you know, so that means we should be the same. Aren't we? I thought the idea was we're better than that, but no. Yeah, like up until now, we never knew that Russia and the United States were exactly the same kind of democracies, but <laughs> apparently that's true. Right, right. Uh, thank you again, Brian. And, thank you. Uh, let's talk soon. Best of luck. Cool. So that is Brian Becker. Uh, look him up and look up the socialist program. They do wonderful work there and uh, really give a larger context that you're not allowed to get on your mainstream media. Um, I wanted to do real quick one more story beyond just Russia, although there are some links. But uh, this is so you guys probably remember that uh, during the um during the election, uh, you know, during the Trump Biden Trump Biden uh, campaigns, uh, it came out about Hunter Biden's laptop, right? And that story was purged from all your social media. Uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, qu famously quit the Intercept because they wouldn't let him report on it. Uh, the, if you tried to post a clip of uh, that story or a link to that story, it would get taken down by Facebook. Um, it was called fake news, right? The, the idea that uh, Hunter Biden had this laptop that revealed corruption, revealed wrongdoing, and the laptop had been left at a repair store. And the initial story was done by the, the uh, New York Post. And then even the New York Post, I think maybe their Facebook page was either suspended or taken down. Uh, and it really was, you know, it was kind of the the fever pitch of this of this uh, fake news, fake news being used to uh, spreading around the internet and, and it's influenced the election and fake news. And, and if you looked at any of the liberal, liberal media, the, the MSNBC, CNN, they would either not mention it at all. Most of them were just not mentioning it at all. But then when they would mention it the little bit, they'd go, oh, the fake news about Hunter Biden. And, and it did have these ramifications, people's accounts being suspended and deleted, et cetera. And, uh, Anyway, so and New York Times, of course, was one of the main ones that was main outlets that was either not talking about it or when they would would, you know, reference how it was fake news. So. Here is this article just the other day. Uh, again, from New York Post, but I'll show their. They're referencing, I'll show the New York Times article they're referencing. So this is not just New York Post. Don't generally don't trust New York Post, but. In this case, uh, they're speaking the truth. So New York Post takes forever to load because it has 85,000 stupid fucking ads because they're a fucking tabloid site, basically. But Hunter Biden's infamous, infamous laptop confirmed in New York Times report. This is just the other day. A comprehensive report about the ongoing federal probe in Hunter Biden's tax filings published by the New York Times on Wednesday confirmed the existence of the infamous laptop. In October 2020, the Post exclusively reported on the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop. The laptop's hard drive contained a trove of emails, text messages, photos, financial documents between Hunter Biden and his family uh, and business associates detailing how the president's son used his political leverage in his overseas business dealings. Um, the repair shop owner reported the laptop to the FBI as part of their investigation into Hunter Biden. The Times reports the New York Times federal prosecutors have looked into emails between the first son and his former business associate that were recovered from the laptop. Uh, some of the scru scrutinized correspondence were between Hunter Biden and Devin Archer, who has served with the first son on the board of the Ukraine energy company Burisma. Archer, who was sentenced last month in an unrelated fraud case. I always love when these people have unrelated fraud case. They're just, you know, these people are all so corrupt and fucking con men on multiple levels that they're like, the thing that you know of them being corrupt about, that's not what they went to jail. You know, they're in jail for, oh, they're unrelated fraud. You know, he, he had a lot of frauds on the, on the fire, on the stove, a lot of frauds on the stove once. That one they got him for. But we're, we're not talking about that one. We're talking about this one over here. Um, 
Archer, who was sentenced last month, unrelated, uh, the, the, cooperated completely. According to the Times, the emails between Hunter Biden, Archer, and others regarding their international business activity came from the files, came from files the publication obtained that appears to have come from the laptop abandoned by Mr. Biden. People familiar with the emails investigation confirmed their authenticity to the Times. The laptop confirmation was included in the Times report that also revealed how Hunter Biden paid off the tax liability of $1 million. By liability, they mean that he was under investigation for defrauding the IRS, and they ultimately basically settled with him. You know, you pay the million dollars, we'll stop coming after you for uh, defrauding the IRS. Hunter Biden has been under investigation for failing to pay taxes since his father was vice president, and the inquiry has broadened. All right, so that's the New York Post, but here is also the the New York Times uh, article from just the other day that they're referencing. Hunter Biden has paid his tax bill, but board f- but but broad federal federal investigation continues, uh, and the New York Times seems to be trying pretty hard not to say <laughs> we were fucking wrong about all this being fake news. The Justice Department inquiry into the business dealings of the president's son has, re- ha- have, has remained active with a grand jury seeking information about payments from around the world. Under Biden also had connections to China, some, some stuff going on in China as well. In the year after he disclosed a federal investigation into his tax affairs in late 2020, President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, paid off a significant tax liability. Mr. Biden's failure to pay all his taxes while wiping out his liability does preclude criminal charges. This, that's one element of a broader investigation stemming from work he did around the world. Hunter Biden is a Yale-educated lawyer. Uh, his professional life has intersected with his father's public service, public service. Ah, that euphemism. That's what Joe Biden does. He does public service as he wages war around the world and imprisons all of the black people he can find across America, uh, including working. This is Hunter Biden again, including working as a registered lobbyist for domestic interests while his father was vice president pursuing deals and clients in Asia and Europe. Um, and he failed to register. Let's see, where's that part? Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Biden intentionally violated the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA, which in, which requires disclosure to the Justice Department of lobbying or public relations. So you'll recall that FARA, uh, Foreign Agent Registration, was used against RT America. They were forced to register as foreign agents, despite the fact that that uh, act was not meant for media outlets and had never been used against a media outlet before. It was meant for people like fucking Hunter Biden, who are literally like lobbyists for other country companies in other countries. Uh, he was literally on the oil board. Right? I mean, on the board of that oil company, Burisma, in Ukraine. And so when he comes back and he talks to his daddy and says, Daddy, can you talk to these people on the oil board I'm on? That's because daddy happens to be vice president of the fucking United States. That's called lobbying for a foreign country or a corporation of a foreign country. And so Hunter Biden is literally was literally doing that. And then, of course, there's the added level of corruption that The New York Times, of course, doesn't want to talk about where Joe Biden uh, said on video. I'm sorry, I don't have the clip handy, but it's still on YouTube, said on video that he held up billions of dollars of aid to Ukraine in order to get the prosecutor fired that was looking into Burisma, the oil company his son's on the fucking board of, uh, and getting paid $50,000 a month to basically do nothing except say, hey, here's my daddy, talk to him, he has power. Uh, So Biden said that he, on camera, said that he got this guy fired, this this, this prosecutor. Um, He, of course, didn't mention on camera that his the company that he was talking about was... uh, was his son, his son was on the board or that that prosecutor was looking into that company. Anyway, the main point of this is to let you know that as all of our mainstream media was running around going, fake news, fake news, Hunter Biden didn't uh, it's on his laptop. They, they can verify any of that fake news, New York Post, fake news. Uh, it was all true. And the New York Times has now admitted that it was true, that that laptop did belong to Hunter Biden that so far all of the correspondence seemed to be legit, not made up, not faked. Um, 
And here's the thing is like his personal stuff. Like, so I think there was also a video on there of him having sex with someone, maybe a prostitute or something. His personal stuff. Fucking. I don't think it, it if he wants to have sex with prostitutes, I think do, do it up, man. His life, do what you want. But when it comes down to literal corruption, being corrupt and getting money from an oil board so that you can introduce them to daddy and not uh, not registering as a foreign agent when you are like literally the definition of that act as opposed to RT America, which was a media outlet. Uh, that type of stuff, absolutely, the American people should know about. And New York Times and all the other outlets ran interference to try and protect Joe Biden. Now, Donald Trump also corrupt as fuck. Corrupt as all get out. Corrupt as you can be. And so were everyone around, pretty much everyone around Donald Trump, his sons, etc. However, Joe Biden and his clan also corrupt as fuck. So you see... The, the our mainstream media, much of it runs interference for, you know, the, the corrupt Joe Biden against the corrupt Donald Trump or Fox News does the reverse. They run interference for corrupt Donald Trump against corrupt Joe Biden. And you get they're all corrupt. They're all the same fucking party. OK, they're all the capitalist business, rich as hell class. That's what they are. And they're 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 the real threat is those of us who are outside of that, those of us who are talking about other things and saying, hey, yeah, both of these parties, same shit. That's the true danger. And I just wanted you to know that even the New York Times, even liberal God New York Times has now admitted that it was all legit as they were running around deleting Facebook accounts, helping to delete Facebook accounts and everyone else, the Atlantic Council, all these goons, all the blue check liberals that were running around saying fake news, fake news. Hunter Biden is a saint. Yeah, all wrong. And just like all other propaganda we face, it doesn't come out till months later when it's already had the impact it needed to have. Running around and banning those pages, banning those comments, banning those threads had the effect that those liberal outlets wanted you to have, wanted it to have. It made people think a certain thing. It made people ignore a story that was true. And that was the goal. So now that it comes out, now the New York Times can you know report that it was true. Doesn't matter. Same with WMD, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as long as the truth comes out a few months after when it was really needed, uh, when the propaganda was really needed, then it did its job. Guys, uh, so as you know, my show canceled my YouTube uh, band around the world. The redacted is not YouTube, not the Moment of Clarity YouTube. Uh, and my podcast, Moment of Clarity, deleted from Spotify. So if you want to see my work continue, please, please check out patreon.com slash Lee Camp. Please become a member over there. The lowest level is like $1.25 a week. Uh, so if you want to help out and continue, see my work continue, see some sort of new show come out, uh, please do go over there and support it. You'll get great uh, exclusive content. You'll get videos like this a day early, uh, earlier than everyone else, or two days early. You'll get exclusive uh, videos. So please, patreon.com slash Lee Camp. We're getting banned. We're getting suppressed. We're getting censored. We're getting deleted. But with your help, I can I can keep doing uh, what, I, what I hope is important work. I hope you view it as important work too. All right, share this around. Let people know and keep fighting.